I think in the future learning will be more open and more accessible and more varied so that more people are able to learn in different ways and for different purposes across the lifespan so that learning will be life wide and lifelong. We might argue that learning has always been available, but often it was available in fairly, fairly narrow forms and to perhaps only a small section of the population worldwide. Um, learning will be more accessible, more open and more available freely to everyone at any time and for any reason. There will be big changes in, in learning that will, that will come down the line. And some of that is around the, the, the structures that we have in terms of a, a degree, looking at micro-credentials, just-in-time training, um, and the way that education might, is getting, I suppose, packaged into, into smaller kind of samples. The future of learning is uh, uh, online and digital because we need to uh, follow the, and adapt to and be proactive with the UNESCO and uh, United Nations uh, development goals, especially in education, number four but also that, that the SDG 4 have influences and impact on all the other SDGs. And the only way forward is online uh, to reach the education for all. So the future of learning is um, likely to be much more flexible, more blended, more hybrid across the continuum of formal and informal learning. I think in terms of the process and uh, who is involved in the learning process, I think we're going to see many more, in, many more stakeholders involved. So it will be in higher education, academics working with learning designers and other stakeholders to make learning more engaging and especially as it goes more online. Outside of higher education and of, of other formal uh, education, we're going to see online learning uh, and online um, pedagogies coming into play within industry. Again, we can see that with some of the big industry players like IBM, Amazon. Uh, they're, in, they're investing in uh, education for their, for their staff and their employees. And I think we're going to see more organizations uh, utilizing online learning. Uh, the current model is often that people are spending a number of days attending workshops uh, that, that disrupts their, their whole work process by, by making uh, certainly the theoretical elements available online that staff can do in their own time and then perhaps coming for shorter workshops where they actually uh, participate in activities that uh, reinforce that, that theory. We're going to see those kind of changes. So it was just in time training for, for industry and industry requirements will become um, a, a much bigger user of online education. So away from higher education, online learning gives many more organisations such as NGOs and businesses the opportunity to upskill their employees or their target audiences. And so I think that there's potential for collaboration between universities and other organisations. So perhaps it's not so much that online learning will take away um, students from higher education, but that there will be opportunities for more authentic collaborations and um, curriculum development going forward. Outside of the higher education context, online learning can be useful to people across their lifespan from childhood right through to older adults post-retirement for any purpose, whether that be employment related, upskilling, credentialing, retraining, but also for reasons that are personal and spiritual and to do with hobbies and self-actualization in the widest possible form. Online learning can cater for any learning, for any person, for any reason. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Monty King and I'm a learning designer at FutureLearn here in London. Um, welcome to everyone joining from around the world. This is a session for, of course, the Asia Pacific region, but if you're joining from elsewhere, uh, welcome. Um, so, uh, I believe we have uh, my compatriots and uh, colleagues online at the moment, Felicity and Matt. Morning. Uh, so, time to just do some quick welcomes. Um, we have here today um, Felicity Parsonson, 
who's a uh, learning designer at FutureLearn, and Matt Jenner, who's the head of learning, and my name's Monty King, and I'm a learning designer. They'll be joining you in the chat uh, to answer your questions through the masterclass, and uh, they'll also be relaying any other questions that I'll um, try and answer on the fly as well. So, this is the session objective today is for us to share our approach to designing an online learning experience, and then we want to encourage you to create your own. And when we're working at FutureLearn on uh, learning design, what we try and do is follow this uh, course cycle, life cycle. So from planning to design through to build, creation, uh, running and then reviewing the course. But today we'd like to look a little bit more closely at the this sort of initial design phase, uh, the planning session. This is the phase rather. So we're going to look at the topic, uh, the big question that we like to develop, the learning outcomes, and also the learning types. There's more to cover in, a, in sort of the life cycle, but this is what we're going to be looking at today. And our session outcomes, uh, that by the end of the session, we hope you'll be able to describe the initial stages of learning design, uh, to create and discuss big questions and learning outcomes, and to plan and design one hour of online learning. There'll be a little bit of an activity for you to, um, to work on. And also, as part of this masterclass, we're going to invite you to share your design with us, and you'll be in a chance, go on the chance to uh, get an upgrade on any future learning course. And we'll share the details of this competition at the end of the masterclass. So, starting out, when we're looking at learning design, the planning phase is really essential. And to start out, we need a topic for the course. And when you're deciding this with educators, you'll often find that agreeing the topic isn't as simple as you might expect. So we've come up with a, a topic uh, that will hopefully be relatively universal that we can discuss today and use as a bit of a model. So we're going to have a warm-up task where people, I want, we want people to share some ideas about bread. It's a bread warmer. That's the last dad joke for the presentation. Um, so we'd like for you in the chat to give us a sentence two or two about where you're from and how does bread feature in your culture or in a culture you're familiar with? So if you can share with us uh, ingredients or topics, uh, the symbolism of bread, any local speciality, or even a favorite memory of bread, share it with us in the chat uh, and Felicity and Matt will be there to, um, to join you. We'll have about five minutes for this activity.
Okay. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many comments coming through. I'm having some passed on. We've been hearing about flatbreads from the UAE, uh, tales of bread makers from the early 90s being used just once. Um, thank you for people sending me some uh, Polish so sourdough, uh, the Latvian bread kiss. Uh, and of course, uh, being from Australia, I appreciate the uh, references to the uh, perfect amount of Vegemite to spread on your toast in the morning. It's the uh, eternal question in Australian culture, uh, how much Vegemite to add. So we, ho we hope we've got you nice and orientated to the task. We're going to be talking a little bit more uh, about bread. Uh, when the learning team met more regularly in the uh, cafeteria at FutureLearn, bread was often a central topic of conversation. That's one of the reasons why we chose it as the um, uh, kind of uh, the uh, theme and the topic of, uh, of the masterclass. So we've got a course topic and it is bread. And you might wonder why. Well, it's got, um, you know, it appears in some shape or form, form across the globe. And we've seen a lot of different examples coming through. It's got lots of cultural significance. It comes in many shapes and sizes. And of course, it's delicious. So we've um, come up with a little bit of a working title. And it's simply Bread, an international cultural and culinary success story. And to kind of work through some of the early um uh, thinking and brainstorming around the course for you, we've come up with some course objectives as well. And they are to investigate the agricultural and culinary reasons behind bread success and to explore the history, culture and social impact of bread. So this can actually take a lot of time working with SMEs because if you're working with more than one, there can be some disagreement over what exactly to, to run with. But I thought we would do this for us uh, for this masterclass in advance to help speed things up. So we've got our topic. Uh, so we're sort of on the right um, on the right track, and now we can start to think about uh, coming up with a big question. We've got all these details of topic and working title and objectives, but what's the big question? But well, what is a big question? I hear you ask. We use big questions a lot at Future Learn. Um, because we feel that they encapsulate the essence or focus of the course. They can provide a focal point for learning. And what we like is for them to be some kind of generative question that requires a bit of consideration, usually some sort of who, what, why, how question, but not something that simply has a yes or no answer. It can be a really useful touch point to um, reflect on at the start of the course and then return to once you finish um, we like to think that it encourages some critical thinking skills developing, and it's very discursive. It starts a conversation between learners. So it moves away from just a didactic one direct directional teaching method and places value on the learner's opinions, their ideas, their experience, and their reflections. We've had some amazing examples of big questions driving courses through the history of FutureLearn, but here's just a couple of examples. We've got what is genetic counselling? So in this just sort of a prompting an explanation in this course from what is gene genetic counselling from the Welcome Genome Campus Advanced Courses and Scientific Conferences, a future learn partner. Uh, a, a slightly more controversial uh, big question is something like when does Australian history start from the course Great Southland uh, from the University of Newcastle, Australia? They might ask something more personal. Like what kind of society would you like to live in as an elderly person in this course on aging populations from Keio University in Japan? It can feel a bit more esoteric, a bit more left field, something like why does Bohemian Rhapsody make you feel so good from a course on music psychology from Griff Griffith University in Australia? And it could be something that appears on the surface quite simple but require a lot more deeper thinking. Something like the, the big question, what is a mind from the course, what is a mind, produced by the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So there are some examples of uh, big questions. And we'd like you to have a bit of a think about a big question for a course on bread. So we've got the working title and our course objectives. And we want to remind you that we want something that sort of encapsulates the essence or focus of the course. It's a generative question that uh, requires a longer considered response. It should encourage reflection. It should be open to some critical thinking, 
and it should spark conversation. So it's about quarter past the hour in London. So I'm going to give you five minutes to post in the chat. Let's see if you can give it some time and post a big question for our course on bread. All right, 
So thank you very much for the uh, suggestions for big questions coming through. We've got a couple of great examples here. Um, thanks to Agnieszka Murdoch for why is bread so central to our life and culture? Uh, Maria Romero Gonzalez's is, is bread the center of our food universe? Um, Claire Gormley's, I'm peaked. My interest is peaked here. Why does bread sell houses? Uh, and Doreen Barneville uh, posted, why is breaking bread together significant? So obviously that kind of uh, cultural reference to the idea of breaking bread. So I think you can see too that from the different examples, um, different big questions would produce slightly different courses with slightly different foci. So it's interesting to think about your big question and how it might direct and drive the um, design of your course. So here's one we prepared earlier. We decided to work on why is bread so significant to so many cultures? And Spot Quiz uh, uh, prize goes to Agnieszka Murdoch for I think one of the closest uh, big questions she'd come up with close to this topic. So why is bread signif so significant to so many cultures? Um, and then what we'd start to do is look at breaking down the um, course uh, week by week uh, by a weekly focus, give it a sub-question, and then start to look at our learning outcomes. Um, each week will have its own learning outcomes, and they all then feed back into the overall topic or big question or course objectives. Everything is connected and aligns with, which in turn means learners are on a nice, clear path to their learning. So if we take the example of one course week, we've got here uh, one here with a weekly focus and sub-question, how is bread produced around the world? And then we need to start thinking about the learning outcomes, and that's the next part. So we've got a topic and we've got a big question. At this point, we might stop and see if there are any questions coming in from um, uh, from Hopin. If not, we'll continue and start to look at learning outcomes. So learning outcomes are essential to helping learners to understand the course focus and setting expectations for what they should be able, better able to do by the end of the course. And getting to match your course, the course objectives to your learning outcomes is really key to the concept of constructive alignment. This is John Biggs's theory. Matching objectives, what you want to teach, with outcomes, which is what you want your learners to do and demonstrate as part of their learning. When we're trying to think about learning outcomes, we often frame it with the sentence, by the end of this course, learners will be able to. And then often these kinds of verbs appear uh, to construct learning outcomes, but we, tr we tend to uh, not encourage them because they're notoriously hard to gauge and they're quite passive. So we'd like to sort of delve more deeply into Bloom's taxonomy and start to think about more active verbs, things like to be able to collect, to explain, to perform, to discuss, to report. And we, don't, we can start to use these verbs to create learning outcomes which could support a week of learning. So if we have the um, weekly subtopic uh, question of how is bread produced around the world, we want you to now start to think about what could you develop in terms of learning outcomes for our course on bread. So we're going to give you another five minutes. And what we want you to do is construct a learning outcome using one of these verbs and the starting sentence, by the end of this activity, learners will be able to, and then use a verb and then finish it off um, with some sort of uh, outcome. So it's now about 24 minutes past the hour here. I'll give you until 29 minutes past and you can post a potential learning outcome uh, in hop in. Um, an example might be uh, compare farming methods. By the end of this activity, learners will be able to compare farming methods for bread production.
production methods to make bread in different parts of the world. Chris Johnston has uh, investigated and contrast the concept of breaking bread in two or more cultures, highlighting the similarities and differences. Uh, and uh, Kirsty Kierzebrink uh, writes, create an infographic for bread production methods, including reference to country or origin. Vilma Gumalskaiti suggests calculate the ingredients needed for three loaves of bread. Um, these are all fantastic. Colleen, Colleen Hodgkins suggests summarize the bread making process and issues impacting on three to five cultural groups. I think you can see there, there there's definitely a varying level of complexity and also a level of a uh, degree of difficulty, if you like. And I should just also note um, uh, a question from John Jack. Uh, how do you deal with the level of complexity in learning outcomes for such a diverse cohort? And it's a very good question. We, um, we are looking more and more at FutureLearn at very clearly labelling the level of courses because I think um, if a course is introductory, it's really important that perhaps when we're developing um, learning outcomes, we think of the sort of lower level uh, uh, verbs on Bloom's taxonomy, things like uh, describe and identify. But I think what you can do is almost scaffold that outcome uh, progression through a course by starting early in week one with those simpler um, tasks that require outcomes which have sort of less cognitive load, if you like, and then build through the weeks so that by later in the week, uh, later in the course rather, you might be ex uh, encouraging more experimentation, design, uh, application and analysis. So that's how I would approach uh, uh, um, designing learning outcomes with a diverse cohort of learners. Okay, so we've got some great learning outcomes there. Um, and then we'll just have a quick look at how this kind of fits into the um, design process. So we've got this weekly um, uh, sub question. And then within that, we've got three learning outcomes we, we're going to cover. And then within each of those uh, learning outcome, we would desire we would design an activity or, or a group of steps, breaking it down even even smaller, to then meet that learning outcome. So the basic architecture of future learn is we have weeks which consist of activities, and these are then further chunked into smaller groups called steps. So let's focus on one activity for the rest of this masterclass. Tonight's discrete bundle of learning and useful for this workshop. So if we've got this uh, as our weekly subtopic and our learning outcomes, we can then start to look at um, activities individually more closely. So what, what we want to keep doing is uh, helping the activities to meet the learning outcomes and to contribute to the big questions and course object objectives, the key to constructive alignment. So we've got to give the activity a clear focus and then make sure that we, it connects. I keep asking ourselves that question of how it connects back to the learning outcome and also how it will contribute to the overall big question and course objectives. We also have uh, activities within course weeks that are kind of tops and tails. They'll introduce uh, transition, for, for example, from the previous week and then also at the end of the course to add a celebratory congratulatory message uh, and then to transition to the next week. So it's really important to have that nice signposted learner journey. And when we think about it in even more detail, we can break it down to the course step level. And then you start to look at a plan that looks a little bit more like this. Uh, and we can plan at step level by breaking the focus of the activity into smaller steps, smaller chunks of learning called steps. We want to ensure that each step contributes to the learning outcome for that activity. So if we look more closely at a specific activity, this one might be about uh, bread making, um, we can then start to think about the step and what will happen in each of them. And there are really two key factors to consider at step level. And this is true for future learn, but also if you're using other platforms and even worth thinking about in your face-to-face -face teaching, thinking about the learning type. So what is it exactly that you want to le the learners to do? What activity are you looking for them to, to be involved in? And also the step type. And this is more about the medium 
you want them to use. And we'll discuss these in a little bit more detail now. But we have our topic, big question and learning outcomes. We can now start to think about learning types. So at FutureLearn, we use Diana Lauriard's six learning types to consider what it is exactly that we want to get the learner to do. They're like Lego bricks uh, and they build a learning experience. They describe what the learner will do, which might be as simple as reading a text, which would be read, or it might be a more complex task, such as debating a political issue, which would be discuss, or writing a line of code, which could be produce. They describe the learning at a high level, and just initially, as there are only six words, but they can be used to explain nearly all kinds of learning activity. These are examples of the physical cards we use in a sort of storyboarding process for, for planning out weeks of future learning, future learning courses. And on the flip side, you can see there's a lot more detail that we can add, um, the kinds of uh, outcome verbs we want to encourage, uh, a description of what's going to happen in the step. Really importantly for future learn, because we are a social learning platform, is the discussion prompt that's going to provoke conversation and also an indication of the learning type. And all of this is really useful when we're in the, the sort of storyboard storyboarding phase of building weeks, activities, and steps. And if we look more closely at just one step, you can see that there's a lot of detail we can go into in terms of the learning type. So we've got produce, practice, discuss, collaborate, investigate, or acquire. And then we need to think about the media, or the step type, rather. Um, and that could be one of a range of things, including an article of text, a video, an audio, a discussion step where the entire uh, object of the, uh, of the step is to engage in conversation through the comments, a poll, which is also a great way to provoke conversations, and a quiz, which is more than just an assessment. It's also a, a learning activity that helps learners check their own progress. But if we just take an example from uh, the activity that we've been working through so far, here is just an indicative example of an activity. And you'll see, for example, that the first step, it's uh, an audio step, but actually what it's doing in terms of the learning we're um, looking for from the, from the learner is it's uh, provoking a discussion. So we've got an audio montage of people explaining bread process, production processes, and then the prompt will be to, uh, ask learners to discuss similarities and differences and the significance of these. We might have a, a straight up reading article, uh, which just sets out some making bread baking processes. And then we might ask learners to investigate by researching the common types of bread in their country and then sharing the ingredients and other information they can find about it in a kind of a, a more uh, investigatory and, and discursive mode. And then finally, we might try a little collaboration where learners contribute to a poll uh, that does a bit of a sense check around the debate about whether bread can truly be defined, a debate that's been going on now for centuries, perhaps not. So that's an example of how we might plan from a week down to one activity within that week with its learning outcome, and then breaking it down even further to the individual step level. And this is where we come to your task, because we mentioned at the start that we'd like you to plan and create a, um, an activity. And this is what we'd like you to do as part of this masterclass. So what we'd like you to do is design one activity for a course. It doesn't have to be on bread. It can be on any topic you like. Uh, and what we'd like you to do is design up to five steps. Uh, you need to think about the course topic. Overall big question, we'd like you to give a weekly topic and then the activity focus, the activity name, include the learning outcome that accompanies the activity. And then for each step, explain the learning type, be that uh, produce, discuss, read, watch, listen, and then describe what happens in the step in less than 50 words. So we'd like you to um, submit this through an online form, either on type form. I'll just show you in a moment.
Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you more details in just a minute, moment. But to wrap up, you can see now, we've talked a little bit about our approach to learning design at FutureLearn, how we develop the topic, the big question, the learning outcomes for each activity within the course, and then the learning types that we're looking to encourage through the steps and the activities. It's important to remember that there are some things we didn't have time to cover in much detail here. Um, some other things that you will need to consider are things like your target audience, the opportunity to bring in collaborators from maybe within your institution or outside. Um, we talk a lot at FutureLearn about telling stories. So looking at how we can develop a narrative that brings the course together. You might also need to think about the business model you're going to use. Will it be completely free or some sort of freemium model? You might need to think about the resources that you already have that exists. And we're seeing a lot of that during the, the COVID-19 pandemic as people look to create courses without being easily able to, to make video. And of course, there are all sorts of other considerations for your local context. So we'd really encourage you to um, share your learning designs uh, and enter our competition. The details are here. Um, we've got a, a, um, a type form, form there, but for people who don't have access to Google, there is also one a, a type form uh, URL you can access as well. So thank you very much for attending our first uh, uh, masterclass on this fine London morning. And wherever you are, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we really want to hear from you and hear how you get on. So if you can use the social media hashtag FLFest to let us know how your design's going. And also we invite you to join the Learning Design Bulletin. And we can include the, um, the links to these in the chat. Um, and what I think now is we'll have time for questions um, and we'll be able to pass them through from, um, from the chat. So we have a question coming in from Kwok Nung, um, who has the question, um, uh, the change of course type and accessibility issues. Are there extensions from them? Um, at FutureLearn, we are always aiming to be accessible and there are a number of different features you'll notice. Um, the first is the ability on courses um, to be able to download the, the videos. So if you're living in an area that doesn't have strong internet, if you are able to go to a place that has better internet, you can download the videos to watch later. Um, so that's in terms of working in low bandwidth scenarios. And I've done a little bit of postgraduate uh, research fieldwork in uh, Timor-Leste, where I ran future learn courses with um, university students who had very limited access to internet. And we found that what we would do is things like download videos to then watch offline together. Um, and so that, that certainly helps with um, accessibility when internet um, is not very strong. And in terms of people living with perhaps um, site difficulties, um, uh, FutureLearn is very um, accessible on screen readers. Uh, and for people with hearing impairments, we make sure that all FutureLearn course videos have subtitles. So the accessibility question kind of um, moves across both uh, 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 
bandwidth scenarios where you might not have very strong internet connection, but also for people who might have difficulty viewing uh, information and listening to it via the internet. So that's what we try and do at FutureLearn to make the courses as uh, accessible as possible. Uh, there's a question here about um, tips on organizing the order and structure of a course. Uh, Anna says, sometimes it seems obvious, for example, chronological for a historical course, but a, deeper, a, a bit of deeper thinking might suggest rather using a thematic approach that forces you to break down the more linear structure. How do you go about deciding what will be the best approach? It's a really good question, and the, the first thing it reminded me of is uh, some of the uh, more recent Netflix documentaries that, that play with the, the, the chronology of, of events to draw out themes. And I think often what we're trying to do with Future Learn courses is provide a very um, simple, accessible, linear learning experience. So if there, there is one to be found, we generally encourage uh, designers to use that because I think it becomes most accessible uh, to the most, the broadest range of, of levels of understanding of a particular topic. Um, but I think too, the alternative approach is to take um, a course week and think about how you might approach it thematically. So I just definitely think it's possible to uh, use both, uh, both approaches, either chronologically, for example, or thematically. But it's about, I think, thinking if there is anything you know that kind of logical coherent and cohesive order of um, information that learners need to be able to take that next step to sort of go outside their zone of proximal development and that's what's really important as well you're trying to make sure that the way that you organize um, the, the the teaching and learning that's going on through through a course um, follows that sequencing that allows the most learners to to benefit the most uh, Maria Romero Gonzalez says, is the time for asynchronous activities included in this design? That's a good question because often what will happen is some people might spend five minutes on some of the more asynchronous activities. Some people make, might spend five hours. So as part of the learning design, we'll just give an indicative um, timing for how long we think a learner will need to take to, to get the most out of uh, the resources, but they can certainly um, be free to, to go and search much more. We recently uh, created a course called How to Teach Online. And in it, we gave lots of uh, links to extra resources that learners could access to, to do a bit of a deeper dive. And we never, or we did, we sort of suggested sort of a, a, a length of time that people should um, spend on this, especially when we knew at the start of the COVID pandemic that people were going to be needing information quickly. But what we found was learners were reporting that they'd often go and spend much more time uh, afterwards asynchronously going out and doing their own research. So I think depending on the learner's uh, interest and you know what they discover, I think it's possible that although your timings for asynchronous activities like investigation uh, can be uh, can be given to the learner, there should always be that space for them to feel like they can, you know, go and do more if, if they want. Um, Una Grant asks, do you take the same approach when delivering what I would term a more theoretical course? For example, um, research on uh, modules on research methods to undergrads. Um, I think it's still possible on a, on a theoretical course to use the, the basic principles of organizing uh, learning into activities and each activity into individual steps. I'm thinking, for example, about uh, if it was something about undergraduate uh, research methods, um, it might be about something as simple as using a Boolean search. A term descriptors to to do um, library research. So you could um, show, give examples of how you might use the and or or uh, function in, in a in a single step, which learners could then go off and apply and try different combinations of search terms to help find different levels of uh, complexity, I guess, in the kinds of searches that they're looking for. So yeah, definitely. I think you could do that for something like 
uh, research methods for undergraduates. Um, Kate Richardson says, how many learning outcomes is too many? We already have program learning outcomes, level learning outcomes, and module learning outcomes. Okay, so that's a good question. And I think what you would try and do is make sure that each of your um, activity level learning outcomes feed into those broader outcomes. You're not looking to create more, but you might be, be able to think more about how the different levels of um, learning outcomes from describe up to analyze and create can be incorporated in such a way is that your activity level learning outcomes are building into something much bigger. And so that you're not creating more, but you're just consolidating them and in a way scaffolding scaffolding them, sorry, so that these ideas are then building towards the overall course level uh, learning outcomes. Okay. All right. So thank you everyone for um, your questions and your examples. Thank you for some fantastic big questions and thank you very much for your insights about bread as well. We've learned so much today. I hope you've enjoyed the um, masterclass. Um, I think we're still going to um, uh, uh, be answering some questions in um, hopping. But otherwise, um, good luck with your learning designs. We look forward to looking at your um, uh, examples. And I don't think I've, I've mentioned that uh, there'll be five um, upgrades on future learning courses available to five entries and we'll be in touch uh, notifying the winners as well. Thank you uh, very much. Imagine a world where the highest quality learning is open to all, regardless of status, location or circumstances. That's what we're building. We're FutureLearn. Our purpose is to transform access to education. We're jointly owned by the Open University and the SEEK Group, world leaders in distance education and employment businesses. We've reached over 10 million learners to date. We're a multi-award winning team with the skills, passion and plan to deliver the best online learning experience. We offer a huge selection of courses from over 175 leading universities and organisational partners all over the world. We make learning simple, one step at a time on mobile, tablet and desktop, so you can fit your learning around your life. And we underpin it all with social learning. What's social learning? Put simply, it's harnessing the power of the community. We learn best when we share and debate ideas with fellow learners, understanding different experiences and perspectives, filling the gaps in our own knowledge. It adds an entirely new dimension and creates a richer learning experience. We make all this happen with flexible short courses, programs, micro-credentials and degrees. Each course is created by a leading university or organisation and made up of bite-sized lessons. You can usually start learning for free. Short course upgrades offer access to all course materials and the chance to earn a certificate. Our unlimited offer allows you to pay once a year to upgrade on as many courses as you like. Paid courses offer a more focused, professionally orientated learning community. Sponsored courses help organisations widen participation in higher education or meet responsibility goals. Our programmes enable you to learn in depth with groups of courses that help you explore different aspects of a topic. Our micro-credentials allow you to upskill or reskill with short stackable courses that award academic credit or recognition of prior learning. We offer a growing range of accredited undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Degrees are arranged as sets of courses which you can take flexibly, depending on how much time you want to commit each term. We also support our academic partners, public bodies and various organisations with a range of extra services. These include course creation, quick authoring for faster course development and improved learning design, plus end-to-end -end support from your own dedicated team. Course analytics to better understand your learner demographics and what they think of your courses. Learner management, 
guide cohorts with powerful course facilitation tools, track and support individual learners, income generation, a revenue share of paid courses and upgrades, as well as tools to attract learners to further study with your organization. Employers can also use FutureLearn in the workplace to upskill or reskill employees. FutureLearn, transforming access to education.